Hi, everyone. My name is Louis Bauer. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about uh, helping users to create better passwords. Now, some of you might remember this topic because I spoke on the same topic uh, last year at this meeting. Uh, but we've actually done quite a bit of, uh, we think, exciting work in the past year that I'd like to tell you about. Uh, this is done in collaboration with a bunch of other people. Uh, uh, the two faculty who are most involved are Nicholas Kristen and Laurie Craner, and we have a bunch of great students who, of course, do all of the work here. Um, I'll start out by uh, reviewing some of, the, some of the things that I talked about last year as well, and then I'll uh, head on into the new stuff. So there have been a bunch of, there have been a bunch of data breaches in... Uh, in, uh, in recent years. In the past year, here's a, uh, a, a, uh, uh, some of the breaches from, uh, during which passwords were stolen and the number of passwords that were stolen during each breach. So we see that it's, it's not uncommon that tens of thousands of passwords or, or, or tens of millions of passwords get stolen from well-known organizations. Now, of course, these passwords often, so sometimes they're in plain text, but often they're not in plain text. But even when they're not in plain text, this can be quite problematic, as this, uh, this quote from uh, Jeremy White, the C CEO of Codeweavers, summarizes very nicely. So he says that even when these passwords are stored encrypted, with enough effort, depending on how strong these passwords are, an attacker who has a large amount of time to crack these passwords is very likely to be able to crack many of them. And when, he has, when an attacker has cracked such a password, he can, of course, use it not only uh, to access the user's account on the site or set of sites from which the password was stolen, but also that user's account on any other site where the user might be reusing this password. And, and as we all know, password reuse is pretty common, so this is a pretty uh, serious threat. So the kind of attacker we're worried about, again, is an offline attacker. He has access to an encrypted password file. And he needs to guess a password before he can crack it. That is, uh, what the attacker does is he has this series of, of uh, encrypted passwords, and he guesses plain text passwords one by one, encrypts them, and sees if they match something in his encrypted list of passwords. He, has, he can make as many guesses as he likes. Nothing is limiting him except time and computing power. And he can make these guesses in a, in a less smart or more smart fashion. So the, the dumb attacker might do something like try to exhaust the password space in, in some sequential way. Right? He might try all eight character passwords that are made up only of the letter A, then he'll change the last letter to B, then to C, then to D, and progress this way until he has really tried every, pass every possible password of a certain length. Uh, of course, a smart attacker might take advantage of the knowledge that he has about how users choose passwords and guess passwords in order of how likely a user is to pick them. And so a user is not likely to pick the password A, 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 B. A user is much more likely, uh, as, as, we, as we have evidence, uh, to pick a password like password or I love you or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Right? So those are the ones that the attacker is going to try first. So in the, the, we assume that the attacker is going to follow some sort of smart guessing strategy uh, like this one. And now that brings us to our question, which is how can we help users create passwords that will stand up reasonably well, or as well as they can, to this kind of attack, while not being too incredibly painful for the user to uh, select or remember or type in on a daily or hourly basis. So we've done a bunch of, uh, we've done a bunch of work uh, in this space. This first bullet talks about the, the, the work that I also talked about last year, which is we investigated password composition policies to see which kind of password composition policy uh, best helps users to, uh, to, to select easy to use but hard to guess passwords. Uh, and since then, we've also looked at passphrases and password strength meters. And that's what I'll really focus on uh, uh, in the next few minutes. So let me talk about password composition policies first. Somebody in this room last year suggested uh, or brought up this uh, XKCD comic, uh, which uh, suggests that instead of having a password with many different character classes. Instead, people should use long passwords. Uh, this comic is kind of interesting because it's gotten a lot of attention. And in fact, a bunch of universities explicitly cite this comic as a reason for why they adopted the password composition policy that they use. Right. And it's kind of a cool comic, but it's a little bit troubling if we're basing our security decisions on, uh, uh, on comics. Um, there is slightly better guidance that administrators can follow. Uh, what CMU did, for example, is look up a NIST document, which, which is a series of guidelines about how to select your password composition policy. But it turns out that this guidance, which is the best that, that uh, we have these days, uh, that system, system administrators have, 
is also not based on empirical evidence, right? It's a, it's a set of heuristics that people who have studied passwords for a while have developed, but they don't actually have, and, and they don't claim to have empirical evidence uh, to, to fully support the guidance that they give. So our objectives in, in uh, studying password composition policies was to carry out a controlled empirical study of, of uh, uh, some set of policies. And we wanted to understand the effect of these policies both on usability and on the security of the passwords that were created under them. At the same time, we also wanted to evaluate the methodology for uh, describing password strength. And people often talk about password strength in terms of entropy. Uh, recently, that has come under attack a little bit, and we wanted to investigate whether uh, the, the, entropy, the, the entropy measures that people were using were, in fact, reasonable measures of password strength or not. So we conducted... Uh, in this particular case, a large-scale online experiment using an Amazon Mechanical Turk to recruit users. In this particular study, we had over 12,000 users who, who, who passed, through, uh, passed through our system. Uh, what happened was that uh, they came into a study. They were, uh, we, we tried to hide from them that this was a study about passwords. We got them to create a password under a randomly assigned password composition policy. We got to take a, take a little survey. And a couple of days later, we emailed them to come back, and they had to log in with their password and take another survey. So as a result of this, we got access to a large body of uh, plain text passwords created under these different uh, password composition policies. And a lot of our analyses are based on uh, these. Uh, a lot of our analyses are of these plain text passwords. But we also got a lot of data, uh, both self-reported and, and recorded during the study, uh, along the lines of how many users dropped out in which condition, how long or how many attempts it took them to select a password or remember a password, type in a password, and so on. Uh, we measured both security and usability of passwords in our analyses. When we talked about security, we used, uh, uh, we used the NIST estimates of password strength using entropy. We used calculated entropy, which we actually calculated from the passwords that we gathered. And we came up with our own uh, method for calculating the guessability of these passwords uh, by a state-of-the-art cracking tool, uh, which we think is, in some sense, uh, the, the ultimate measure of security, because this is actually what an attacker would be using. And in terms of usability, we looked at, as I said, the number of creation attempts, uh, the number of recall attempts, whether the password was even recalled successfully, uh, reported sentiment. We actually asked the users did they find this fun or annoying or difficult, and so on. Uh, how often they reported writing the password down or how often we detected the password being cut and pasted into the browser, uh, as well as study dropout rate. And there, there are a few more that, that I'm not going to go into. Uh, so I'll just give you a snapshot of the results, and they'll mostly be about guessability by, by one of these state-of-the-art cracking tools. The results will mostly will be on the graph like this. So here, the y-axis is the percentage of passwords cracked, ranging from zero at the bottom to, in, in this particular case, 70 at the top. The x-axis is the number of guesses the attacker had to, to make to crack uh, this percentage of passwords. So what you see here is for one of our conditions where the only password requirement is that the password be eight characters long, we see that, that uh, after uh, 10 to the 13th guesses, the attacker has cracked about 60% uh, of the password space. Oh, sorry, of the passwords in this set. Um, there are a couple of uh, different points that you might care about on this graph, and they're here indicated by these vertical, uh, vertical lines. The one on the left is how much it might take an attacker, how, how many uh, passwords the attacker might crack after one second of effort. The one in the middle is after one day of effort, and the one on the right is after 62 years of effort. And of course, these are sort of very hand-wavy because this hugely depends on what kind of hardware the attacker is using and what kind of algorithm was used to encrypt or hash the password. So this could be off by a few orders of magnitude in any direction, but, but at least it gives you a very rough idea. Um, right, so we'll look at the one second, one day, and 62 years versions. Uh, here at the, at the one, day, uh, one day line, the attacker has cracked just over 40% of the passwords. At the 62 years line, he has cracked just under 60% of the passwords. Now I'll bring in a bunch of lines that, talk, talking about, that, that represent the results for the other password conditions. And I'll only tell you about the, some of the specific conditions that, uh, that were particularly interesting to us. So here's a subset of the conditions that we tested, ranging from this, this uh, uh, simplest basic eight condition, which only has a eight character length requirement, to on the bottom a basic 16, which has a 16 character length requirement. Uh, one thing to notice uh, immediately off the bat is these conditions, these password composition policies differ hugely 
in how effective they are against an attacker, right? At the top, we have this basic eight policy where 60% of passwords are cracked in the end versus in basic 16, only about 13% are cracked, right? So huge difference. So, so right off the bat, we see the password composition policies make a, make a big difference uh, if you're worried about these kinds of attacks. Um, if we look at, at the policies that perform best, I'll just focus a little bit on, on what we call comprehensive 8 and basic 16. So basic 16, as I mentioned there, the only requirement is that the password have at least 16 characters. Comprehensive 8 is something like what we use at CMU, which says that the password must have at least 8 characters, but it has to have a lowercase letter, an uppercase letter, a number, a symbol, uh, and pass a dictionary check, and no more than three of any symbol, and a couple of other rules that nobody remembers. Um, so these two both performed, both performed well, they, they, they're, the, they're the two best performing conditions uh, against attackers. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting to note about them, even though uh, basic 16 performs better than comprehensive 8 uh, for, against an attacker who's going to try for many years, this is not necessarily the case for an attacker who's going to try for less time. So if we look, if we look over towards the middle of the graph, we see that uh, basic 16, in fact, does not perform in that particular situation as well as basic 8. And there's an inflection point be, be, uh, before which, in fact, basic 16 performs fairly poorly relative to uh, comprehensive 8. Um, just a snapshot of a, of, a, of a usability result. This is one where we, asked, we actually asked people to, to talk about how annoying or how difficult it was to create a password under each of under under whatever condition they were in, and in some uh, you see the pa the names of the conditions on the left, and in some sense this graph is the inverse of the previous one, right? The the, uh, the password composition policy which provided the least security, basic eight, that one is also the least annoying because passwords are really easy to make, but it's interesting if we focus on the two most secure password composition policies, comprehensive eight and basic sixteen, we see that while in many cases, basic 16 was more secure than uh, comprehensive 8. It's also the case that basic 16 is less annoying and less difficult than uh, comprehensive 8. So this suggests that, well, this, this tells us that, uh, sorry, uh, this tells us that although both of these conditions are more resistant to guessing and less usable, basic 16 under many conditions beats comprehensive 8 both for guessability and for usability, right? So this is, seems to be one of the few cases in, uh, in, in security where we, have, we don't have to make this trade-off between security and usability, right? The, the longer passwords seem to be, under most conditions, both more secure and more usable than the shorter password with many different uh, other requirements. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about, about uh, the work we did on comparing metrics uh, because there's, there's, there's really tons more than, than I have time to go through. I'll just show you this one graph. Um, uh, you don't have to, you don't have to uh, understand every last bit of it, but this, is, this on the left side under, uh, is trying to show the same graph inverted that I was showing you before. In the middle, it's showing you the empirically calculated entropy, so the entropy of the, password uh, of the sets of passwords created under the different password composition policies. So this entropy we actually calculated from the plain text. And then the right, is the entropy score that the NIST guidelines uh, uh, assign to each password composition policy. So I guess the interesting takeaway, or one of the takeaways here, is that some of the policies to which NIST assigns the same entropy value, in fact, are very different, both if we try to calculate the entropy uh, from the plain text of the passwords and uh, if we look at uh, how many of the passwords an attacker could guess. So uh, this, the, the, a brief takeaway from this is, well, some, some of these measures like NIST entropy, they're, they're not entirely worthless, right? There's some correlation between what value the, the, uh, uh, NIST, uh, the NIST guideline assigns with the values that we calculate, but the correlation is pretty poor. So if you really care about your, your, the security of your passwords, uh, you ought not to rely on, on the NIST guidelines uh, too much. Okay, so I'll switch, I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, passphrases now. So this is the second thing that I investigated, uh, and it's something that this XKCD comic suggests directly, right? So, so here the comic is suggesting we should all have passwords that, that have the form correct horse battery staple, that is, a set of words instead of, instead of, these, uh, uh, in, instead of these shorter passwords which have characters which don't necessarily have a clear meaning. And the idea is that passwords like that, passphrases, will be 
approximately as secure, but easier for users to deal with, easier to pick, easier to remember. Uh, so this is something that we wanted to investigate because partly because people often uh, brought up this comic to us, to this comic to us, but also because people are actually starting to use passphrase policies. There are a couple of universities that use policies like this. So what we did is we ran a study we, where we explored the usability of three and four word system assigned passphrases and compared them to system assigned passwords of similar security. Now, you might pick up on this system assigned bit here, uh, and we had to make, in this particular study, uh, uh, the, the password system assigned instead of user selected, because very little is known about how to crack, uh, how to crack these long passphrases, right? which doesn't mean that they're necessarily hard to crack, it just means the techniques for doing this are not well established. Right? And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to control for security, which we could do if we assigned the passwords and passphrases to users, and just study whether if we controlled for security, we could show that pass, passphrases were more usable or less usable than, uh, than passwords. Um, so some questions that we wanted to answer were, well, do people like passphrases, passphrase, passwords or passphrases better? Are people faster at entering one versus the other? Uh, are they, uh, is, is one versus the other easier to remember? In terms of specific passphrase schemes, is there a particular scheme that performs best? And we also looked a little bit at, at whether we can correct for some errors at, of, at password input by, by using some error correcting techniques. So here we tested three types of passwords and eight variants of passphrases. We tried different, several different levels of security, mostly between uh, 30 and 36 bits. And we vary the type and size of, of the dictionary from which we pick the passwords and passphrases. So here are the pass passwords conditions that we looked at. We looked at more or less random, character, random passwords of length five and six. Uh, so you, you see an example of each. And we also looked at uh, length eight passwords that were pronounceable according to a definition of pronounceable that, that NIST seems to like. Uh, you, you may not find these pronounceable, but, but in some sense they, they, uh, they certainly seem more pronounceable than the, than the randomly picked ones. So the idea here is that because they were pronounceable-ish, they might be easier to remember or type in. Um, for passphrases, we focused on forward passphrases. We picked these words from dictionaries of different sizes, right, from, from about 200 to about 1,000 words. Uh, there here are a couple of examples from the large dictionaries of passphrase. My, passphrase might be land, recent, describe, product. Uh, we also tested several kinds of passphrases that we thought might have even better usability than a standard passphrase. So an example is, a passphrase where it doesn't matter in which order you enter the words. Right? Normally the order matters, but we also tested a condition where the user could enter the words in a different order and it would still count as, uh, as the correct passphrase. We also tested something like four nouns, right? instead, of, instead of words uh, of random types, four nouns, because maybe it's easier to remember nouns than verbs or adjectives. Uh, we tested, we tested a, a passphrases of, uh, of a smaller number of words, so just three words, and we tested uh, sentence-like passphrases. So, so a sentence-like passphrase was one which, which was composed of a noun, a verb, an adjective, and a noun. Uh, and, and so they, they, they kind of sort of seem to make some sense, like plan, build, sure, power. And again, the idea is maybe because they made some sense and resembled a sentence, they would be easier to remember. Um, so what's the takeaway? Well, the takeaway here is mostly that you really need to do your research before picking your security policy and, and, instead of relying on the comic. Uh, I won't go into a great deal of detail, but, but at a high level, uh, we found that there was no clear user favorite. You know, there, there was, uh, in, in general, the password conditions actually performed a little bit better. People did not uh, remember passphrases better. Passphrases were not easier to type in. Uh, in fact, they took considerably longer to type in, mostly because they're much longer, but also because they were longer, people made many more mistakes while typing in passphrases, so they also needed more attempts in order to enter uh, their passphrase uh, correctly. Uh, on the positive side, there are things you can do with error correction with passphrases that you can't do with passwords, which might help uh, a little bit. Uh, and although, although passphrases clearly don't just solve the problem, we should not just all move to using passphrases into, in, in, instead of pa passwords, there are some positive signs. So, so one interesting positive sign was that uh, passphrases did not seem to become more difficult to remember as we increased the size of the dictionary from, each, from which each word was drawn which suggests that even though uh, if we want 
passphrases to be as secure but more usable than passwords. So that doesn't work so well. Maybe we could have passphrases that are as usable but much more secure than passwords. So that's something that uh, we still want to investigate. And surprisingly, these pronounceable passwords performed really well. They basically uh, beat every other condition, both in terms of how much users like them and, and in terms of how easy they were to remember and type in and things like that. Okay. Uh, the last topic I want to, do, want to go into is password meters. So password meters are this mechanism for providing users feedback while they're creating a password on the strength of their password. Right? So this is something that, that users are supposed to be able to take advantage of in order to create better passwords while they're picking them. Uh, these are very widely used. Google has one. Uh, WordPress has one. Uh, Usenix has one. Uh, they come in all different shapes and sizes. These are actually ones that we captured from the web. So clearly there's no... Uh, no, no single set of guidelines that people use to create these kinds of password strength meters. Uh, and we wanted to see whether and how these password meters affect uh, password composition, the guessability of passwords created in the presence of a meter, how they affect the creation process in general. Do people spend a lot more time creating passwords? Uh, we, we wanted to see whether these passwords were equally memorable as passwords created without the meter, and, and also we wanted to know what people, we put, what people thought about them. Uh, and additionally, uh, we wanted to know which elements of meter design are difficult, right? So I showed you a bunch of different meters. We wanted to see which of these directions is the right one, if any of them, you know, in terms of designing meters. Um, so we tested, we tested 14 or 15 different uh, types of meters. We had some control conditions. We had a set of meters which had visual differences. We had a set of meters that had scoring differences, so, so not visual, but th that they just differed in, in the score they gave to each password. And then we had some conditions where, which had both visual and, and scoring differences. Um, I'll very briefly run through what these meters are. Our baseline meter was something that we thought was pretty, uh, pretty standard. Uh, we sort of cobbled it together from, from some of the most common meters that we, we saw in the wild. Uh, it was one where if you typed in eight lowercase, eight lowercase letters, that would fill one-third of the meter, and the meter would give you a high score if you typed in a really long password or if you used many different uh, character classes. So this is what this baseline meter looked like. Um, as you start typing in, you see the meter, the meter starts to move. Now, one interesting thing, well, one, one, of it, one of the characteristics of the meter is that it has a non-segmented bar, so that is the, 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 the bar just grows in, in, uh, in very small increments. Uh, it also uh, uh, gives some feedback in, terms, in, in, uh, in text, right? So it tells you the password is bad or poor, or fair or good or excellent. Uh, and it also gives uh, the user a suggestion about how the user might make the password stronger and thus the, the meter happier. Um, so as we, as we, as we um, uh, start typing in a password, the, a suggestion might be that the password is in the dictionary of common passwords and so ought to be made, uh, ought to be made stronger. Um, the color of the meter also changes as the, the bar gets filled from, from red to, to orange to, to green. And at the end, the meter gets filled up and the user gets told that this is an excellent password. So let me just show you all at, all at once the, the different meters um, uh, the, the, the meters with different visual differences that we tested. This, this again is the baseline meter. Uh, we tested a three segment meter, which is not continuous, but has, has grows in chunks. We tested a meter that doesn't change color. It's always green. We tested a tiny meter and a huge meter. Uh, and we tested a meter that, that only uh, in text only told you whether your password was good or bad and didn't, didn't give you a suggestion. Oh, we also had a, a condition where we only had the text but not the meter itself. And so you see how in these different meters, how they, they change as the, the password that's being typed in uh, grows more complex and longer. Um, we also had this uh, extra condition, which was the, the, the bunny condition, where instead of having a bar, we had a dancing Bugs Bunny, and the, the better your password was, the faster the Bugs Bunny danced. We sort of wanted to have this, uh, both for entertainment and, and actually uh, it was an interesting scientific question to see whether the bar was the right way to go or maybe something a little bit more entertaining. Uh, in terms of scoring differences, again, starting from the baseline meter, we had a meter that gave the user half the score of the baseline meter, but was otherwise identical, and one that gave the user one-third of the score, or the user's passwords, one-third of the score uh, as the baseline meter, but was otherwise identical. And then we had two more meters, one which tried to nudge the user towards having just a long password as opposed to long or complex, 
and another one which tried to use, nudge the user just towards having a complex password as opposed to uh, a long one. So here you see how these grow and when the baseline meter is completely filled out, you see that the half, half score meter is uh, only yellow and uh, the uh, one third score meter is still, is still red. Okay, so when we, we performed studies similar to the previous two where we ran a lot, a lot of people through, online, uh, through, through an online study where they got to create, uh, create passwords, come back, recall them a couple of days later, each, each person was randomly assigned to one of these different meters, and then we analyzed the pass, the, the, these different conditions according to how the passwords were composed, uh, according to their, the guessability of the passwords uh, by cracking tools. Uh, we looked at the password creation process in more detail, the memorability sentiment. Um, the graphs are kind of the same form as, as the ones for password guessability because I'll only uh, show you some of the guessability results. Uh, we see that here, uh, again, we have three lines which are similar to the previous ones. Here in the no meter condition, uh, about 36% of the passwords get cracked uh, by this medium adversary who takes a couple of days to do this. Uh, if we show you the baseline meter, it does a little bit better, but it turns out not statistically better, but still there's, there's uh, some hope. Um, if we look at all the visual differences, you see that they all kind of appear in the space either surrounding the baseline meter or between the baseline meter and no meter. So all of these visual differences don't make any difference at all. Right? It doesn't really matter whether a meter is small or tall or green or not green or a Bugs Bunny, same thing. Uh, what does matter more is uh, scoring differences. So if you, before you saw both, most of the lines were in between the no meter and baseline meter. If we look at the different scoring differences, they all outperform uh, the baseline meter. And in particular, if we look at these stringently scoring meters, which assign the user only a half, a sc half the score or one third of the score, uh, those, those perform uh, significantly better and statistically significantly better than either no meter or, or the baseline meter. Uh, so the takeaway here is that meters do work. If you want your users to create stronger passwords, you, sh you should use a password meter and in particular, uh, you want to use a stringent meter, that is one that is uh, very stingy at telling users that they did a good job. Uh, it turns out that meters manage to get people to create better passwords without uh, usability cost. That is, the passwords that are produced are still equally easy to type in and remember and so on. But uh, with respect to stringent meters, there is this caveat that don't make them too stringent because there is a line after which if you keep making them more stringent, users just get confused and, and uh, don't like your meter much anymore or pay attention to it. Uh, right, so I already talked about this stringency matters. Having a visual component matters, but all the details of the visual component really doesn't. Uh, so that brings me to my last slide. We've been doing this for a little while, trying to figure out how to, how to create, how to help users create better text passwords, because we all know, even though we hate passwords, they're not gonna disappear overnight or even the next couple of years. Uh, we've, done a, we've done a bunch of work at this point and we, we feel like we've really, uh, been able to generate some advice for system administra administrators about how to deal with passwords, but we've no, by no means reached the end of this investigation. Right? Every time we do a study, we come up with ideas for two more studies that we'd like to do, and certainly one of the things that we'd like to be able to do at the end is come out with a, a set of definitive guidelines where we can say, well, if these are, these are, this is your organization uh, and, and these are your, your uh, considerations when it comes to security, here is what we I strongly believe you should be doing in terms of a password policy, in terms of a meter, in terms of other things as well. Thanks very much, and uh, I guess I can answer questions during the panel. Patrick, 